the air, you know, last um, last last month. So I've been around a long time, and I do all different reviews for the credit union. But I am the physical security expert um, for the you know for the risk management department, and I do um, you know again a tremendous amount of robbery training and also active assailant training. But here's my contact information. Um, if you want to, you know. Uh, below my picture if you want to get my number and, and reach out to me again i'll be more than happy to schedule whatever you need for that but i take great pride in doing the you know robbery you know presentation because life safety is the number one you know the thing for all of us uh even though we are the bonding company even though we pay the claim if there is a robbery we don't care about the money at all so everything i'm going to go over today is all about safety for your staff you know for your membership for your directors and for visitors and vendors and everybody involved so please you know understand that um and today we're going to be talking about robbery trends you know what to do before during and after and making your organization less attractive to criminals um and uh, always understand too that each location that you have is going to be different uh you're not gonna have the same security features uh at at every location um so it's going to be very uh, a, a location specific if you're in a high risk area you know then you're going to um you know have other security features you know built in and i work with credit unions as well if you're looking at a new location you're renovating a new location you know saves false alarms layouts and what have you i do all of that so again Feel free to just reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to help you out in, in any way I can. And part of one of my designations, being a credit security fraud expert, really was talking to bank robbers to see what makes them tick. Why would they rob one institution over another? I um, mean, what it did was validate all the things I've been talking about for the last you know, 30 plus, 35 plus years. Um, and there's a lot of simple things that your credit union can do to make, make a, your, your branch less attractive to criminals. So here are some key statistics. 94% of the robberies happen in a branch location. And that's a pretty high amount. A branch location is not connected, like say to the main office where you would have your majority you know, of your back office people. And the reason for that, a lot of times the branches have less, um, you know, less employees, less member traffic in a more rural area. A demand note is the most common type of robbery, 59% you know, times you know, you handed a, a demand note. And the only one who knows of being robbed is that one teller. And the Western states account for 36% of the, of the robberies. Yeah, as you can see that different times of the day um, and also different days of the week, they're, they're pretty, pretty similar. But what we kind of find is on a Friday afternoon between three and six is a common area because if I have a particular time, if I have a particular vice, drugs, alcohol, gambling, um, and I know that most institutions are closed on a weekend, that if I go, um, if I go all week, you know, if I don't rob the credit union on a Friday or bank on a Friday, then I have to go all weekend without my vice. And if I do go all week, so three to six is a popular time on a Friday. If I do do go all weekend, uh, not you know, robbing an institution. Then first thing Monday morning, from uh, you know, you know, from uh, you know, nine to eleven is a common time as well. But you should be very vigilant um, all all times of the day and all days of the week. But those are the times that we're kind of seeing because of people having the, you know the different you know vices. There are different types of robbery you know types we have the single attack teller that's a no pass remember 59 percent. it's a no passer that that uh, the person comes in they just hand the note um this particular robber there's normally always one uh usually they may or may know may or may not show a weapon but always assume you know that they have a weapon normally it's a low dollar amount because we always recommend credit unions reduce the money in the at the teller station. You have a you have two teller draws. You have a working supply up top. You might have twenty five hundred dollars of that. Then you have your bulk supply down below. No, most no passers just hand the note, say give me the money in your top draw. And the reason why you want to have less money in the top drawer is if a robber gets less money, you're less likely to be robbed again. It's uh, very common that when you are robbed once, you're robbed for the second or third time you know, in a short you know, period of time. This is definitely the least traumatic for everybody involved, the staff in membership. And when you are handed that note, pick it up by the corner, slide it over to the side. I do not recommend dropping it on the ground because if you drop it on the floor and the a robber wants it back, you have to bend over and you're out of sight of what, um, you're, you're out of sight of the robber. They might think you're hitting the robbery alarm button. So again, your safety is most 
most important, even though there's a lot of evidence on that note. Then then the most traumatic type robbery is a televol takeover. There's uh, generally at least two people. They must always have weapons. One person stays on one side of the counter while the other one jumps over the counter. They go up and down the tele counter um, and get the money in the top drawer most of the time. And they go to the safe in the vault and they're there for an extended period of time. Where the single attack teller type robbery, they're in and out probably within one or two minutes. The takeover type, they're in there for an extended period of time. And definitely the most uh, traumatic for staff and members and everybody who might be in the office. And it's def uh, definitely higher do dollar losses because they go up to multiple tellers and they go to the safe in the vault area. We've also had uh, many robberies at ATMs. And whether the uh, employees were, you know, servicing the ATM, ATMs themselves uh, or, you know, we had armored car, you know, being attacked while they're servicing, you know, the ATMs. Anytime you're servicing, uh, uh, transporting currency yourself, whether it's to the ATM, to another branch or a bank, always put it in a nondescript bag, you know, go different times of the day, uh, different uh, routes um, and and. And just be very much aware of your surroundings because, you know, uh, people will follow you. And we also have a mine offender bender type of robberies. What they will do is they know you're transporting currency. They might just bump your car. You get out to exchange papers. They might rob you at that particular time. So if you do get involved in a mine offender bender, go to a populated area. It would be the best thing for everybody involved and, and for your safety. And we also have um, armored car drivers being attacked. And the reason for that is we have an employee shortage everywhere. Armored car drivers, the same type of uh, situation where armored cars used to come once a week. And now because of the shortage of employees, they might come once every two weeks. So instead of getting one delivery for 100,000 once a week, it might be once every two weeks getting 200,000. So again, risk versus reward. Also, they used to have two people uh, delivering the um, the money, and now you only have one employee who's driving the vehicle and also transporting, uh, going into the branch by themselves, with not, not under the watchful eye of anybody. And again, you, you're definitely more, you know, prone to attack in situations like this. So you want to get that money, um, meet that armored car driver, get that money, lock it up, and wait for two people to uh, to count it whenever possible. And we also have members being attacked using the ATMs, and then we also have members being attacked, getting money out of the uh, out of the credit union as well. So it's called jugging, where uh, people are outside watching, and when when you you're counting money to the members, and they see that they're getting cash, they're attacked as they come out of the credit union. They're being followed, and then they're being attacked at gunpoint later on um, as they're driving away. Uh, also, you want to make sure you have good opening and closing procedures. Uh, we call them uh, morning bloomer uh, robberies where you know two people should arrive together. They should drive around the building, make sure there's no noticeable signs of forced entry, no broken windows, uh, no open doors, no suspicious vehicles, no one loitering in the parking lot. And then the two people arrive together. One person goes into the branch. They clear the branch, make sure nobody's in the branch, and they give an external all-clear signal. And we also recommend an internal all-clear signal as well. The internal all-clear signal is only visible by the people who are looking into the, the credit union, the employees looking into the credit union door. Um, because if I case you, I'll know what your external all clear signal is. But if I I don't know, you have an internal one. So this is another layer of security. Also, you should have some type of, um, you know, uh, passcode, passphrase. So if you don't see the all clear signal, you might call into the credit union and if uh, to see if that person's okay. Do they just forget to give the signal or do they give the wrong signal because you change it frequently? Um, and then you might have a passcode by saying if you say the the color red, that means, you know, the, there's an issue. Um, but that's something you want to work out, you know, as, you know, as well. And that that uh, all clear signal should be changed at least quarterly. At closing time, you should have closing procedures. You know, you should clear the building, make sure everybody's out of the building. There's no one in the bathrooms. Actually look underneath desks, look at it, it look, uh, open the doors, look at the stalls in the in the bathrooms. Um, and, and then once that once the building is cleared, you know, two people should leave together, but we don't recommend they leave hand in hand together. We recommend one person stays in the credit union while the other one goes to the car. The person gets in their car, they they start it up, they, the doors are locked, and when they're in their car, then the last person will leave the credit, set the alarm, and lock the door, then walk to the car to watch live that second person. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned, the armored car procedures, you should have to greet the uh, armored car driver as quickly as you possibly can, lock that money up. You might have you have them come at different times, of the uh, different days, different times, um, and then where they might be able to park. So we're going to be just be talking about before, during, and after. If you do all these different things before, hopefully you won't get to, you know, during and after. Uh, and subtle things do do work. So I always collaborate with law enforcement to see how, how they respond to a robbery in progress. A lot of credit unions have a philosophy, activate the alarm when safe to do so. What does that mean? When safe to do so to me means when the robber's out of the building, I'll activate the alarm. I lock the, I, the robber's out of the building, I lock the door, I call the police, I activate the alarm. When safe to do so for another person might be immediately, and when safe to do so for another person might be, you know, if I'm a loan officer across the lobby, I see a robbery taking place, I can hit that robbery alarm. Uh, without being seen but what's happened now is the uh, robbers are coming in with police scanners on their belt so you hit that robbery alarm and all of a sudden i'm standing here with a weapon and all of a sudden uh, over my scanner there's an armed robbery xyz credit union i'm not going to be happy again it's not worth jeopardizing safety of your staff so most of uh, paul most procedures are robbery procedures would be when the robber's out of the building lock the door call the police and also activate the alarm but that's certainly a credit union decision so you want to work with local police department you want to you always want to monitor uh and review your policies and procedures and update them accordingly you want to consider branch design and security options. Some credit unions have time locks on, on a safe vault where you set it. It can't open up for 15 minutes uh, for time delay. And uh, and time locks where you set the, the, the combination uh, at the end of the day where you can't open it up for 12 hours. I have not seen that as, as common recently as I used to when I started way back when. The time locks you might see on big vault doors where you have safe deposit boxes, but I really haven't seen the time locks and I have not seen the time delays in a long time as well. There's pros and cons, you know, to both. Uh, queue lines is the rope that directs traffic. It's nice to have that rope. A robber does not want to wait in line. So even if you have a sign, line starts here. If a robber comes in and they go right up to a teller, it's going to draw attention to themselves. And if, if you have a line of people and the robber goes right up to a teller, people in line are going to say, buddy, the line starts over here. So having the queue lines is not only uh, keep law and order in your lobby, but also uh, directs traffic. Lockable gates, a door to the teller area. You want to make sure your teller area is sealed off. I mentioned the takeover type robberies. One person will get up and over the counter. If your teller counter is a good height, uh, you have a, it's sealed off, you have a lockable door. And even if you have an ADA station at the end, which you might have a lower desk, just continue with a piece of plexiglass all the way across. So the appearance is the teller counter is all the same height. But if you have a low desk at the very end, it's easy for somebody just to step over. Having height markers throughout the credit union is great, but certainly at the entry exit doors, it is very difficult in space to see how tall somebody might be. So if you have these height markers near the entry exit doors uh, when a person's leaving or you might have a camera catching it, you'll see how tall somebody might be. A lot of warning lights or lights that would, if your robbery alarm is activated or a button is activated, a light will come on in the back room, say in a break room uh, or an office that you, know, you could blindside a robber. Um, for the safety of the employees, if that light comes on, it says means stay put. Do not come out into the line of, uh, do not come out to the lobby. Um, if you do have alarm warning lights, a lot of times they are um, they're activated when you hit a robbery alarm. So if your philosophy is do not hit the robbery alarm button until the robber's out of the building, then that alarm warning light really is rendered useless. So we would just recommend that alarm warning light be put on a separate actuator. It will only put on the light, but will not activate the alarm. And having surveillance cameras inside the building, outside the building, and they have what they call door jam height market cameras now that's on the strip just before you leave the building. So you come in the vestibule and uh, you come into the branch. Normally the robber has the disguise is on but when they leave and the vestibule before they go out to the parking lot they normally take off their disguise and that door jam height market camera will get a it's a it's a, there's a pinhole camera say at five and a half feet and it gives a perfect visual of that robber as they're leaving uh, again different plans for different offices uh, you want to train the entire staff not just frontline people do not allow people to be lured outside we have a lot of robbers now who are trying to create a diversion. You know, they might have somebody come in. There's a, you know, a, a fire in the bushes or there is an accident. If that does happen, you know, might have a person that goes out there to see if everything's okay, but everybody awareness, you know, should be heightened. 
um, for sure. I was doing this uh, presentation in the lobby of a credit union. They had an ATM in, in the vestibule. And it was at closing time. The safes and vaults would have been wide open. And somebody came in to use the uh, the ATM. And I said to the staff, what would you do right now if that person fell to the ground? They all said, well, I'd run out right, I'd run out and help them. But if you run out and help them, uh, they could pretend they're, they're on the ground. You know, they had some type of medical event. As soon as you open up that door, they could spring to their feet and force their way in, hold all of you hostage and all the money's totally exposed and there's no activity. So be aware of that. I'm not saying don't help somebody, but be aware that the robbers are being more creative. Um, I was also, you know, you don't want to be uh, let anyone in before hours or after hours as well. I was doing a presentation in the lobby of a credit union. In the middle of my presentation, somebody came to the door. He had a uniform on. He had a package in his hand. An employee got up, went, opened up the door, signed for a package and sat down. I said to that individual, do you know who that person was? I said, no, my guy had no idea, but he had a uniform on, so he had to be official. How easy would it have been for anybody to... Uh, come in after hours, you know, while the, the safes and vaults are all wide open, you're balancing, somebody comes to hold a package, you open up that door, they force their way in. It could be a very dangerous situation. Escort visitors out at closing. So if you close at five, you know, walk a member out, open the uh, open the door, let them out and pull that door shut and lock it until all the people are out. If you let them go out by themselves, we call them hitchhike robbers. What happens is that door might take three seconds to close. And by the time that it closes and locks, somebody could run, grab the door and come in. And we always reduce the money at the teller station, workstations, and also in the branch itself. Less money robbers get, the less um, less uh, less chance they're going to come back and rob you. And have you may want to look into having an ambush or a stress code on the alarm system. What that is is when you come in in the morning, you put a code in that will deactivate the motion detectors, the door contact, the safe alarm. An ambush or a stress code is a separate code that you put in. Will still deactivate all the alarms that will let the, the monitoring company know that you just opened up the credit and the duress. And this is a, a, a good thing to know. And if you do have a ambush or a stress code, everybody who opens or closes the branch should know what that code is. And you should go over it periodically because a lot of people say, I, I have a code, Mike, but I'm not sure what it is. But I have it in my wallet, I have it in my purse. Um, it doesn't do you any good. And that code should not be 0911. So loose lips sink ships. You never want to talk about work outside of work, social media. Uh, or if you're going bowling, you don't want to say, well, how much you saw at your branch? We saw 300000 Well, that's nothing. We saw 500000 at my branch. I was walking by, and I was in a lobby of a credit union doing a review, and one teller said to the other, hey, Mary, are you going to go out to lunch? And Mary said, no, I can't go out to lunch today. I'm cars coming at noontime, and I have to count a million dollars. I heard it, and everybody else heard it um, as well. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't discuss anything um, about work. And even when you're talking internally with each other, do not, you know, talk loudly, because if you're talking, you talk about money, which is your commodity, like a shoe company talks about shoes, which is their commodity. You might be talking to your, you know, your colleague and, and people are listening in. So again, be very discreet. Always stay alert for your surroundings. You want to make sure that if you see any cars parked in the parking lot for an extended period of time facing, you know, the branch, don't be afraid to take down the time, the date, the license plate number of that person, and don't be afraid to call the police. A professional rob will case you five times inside and out, so they'll show up at your branch. They'll park there every Thursday morning from 9 to 11 and, and, and look. They say, okay, um, between 9 and 11, there's only five employees who work at that branch. Army car comes at 930 and there's no member activity from 930 to 10. So what time are they going to rob you? As soon as they drop all that money on a Thursday, uh, that's the time they're going to rob you. Five employees, no member traffic from 930 to 10, and you just got the cash shipment supply. So be very observant as you're looking out the window. Write down the information before you call the police because they also are coming with police scanners in the car. And if you call the police, um, before you write down the information, they'll hear that the police are being dispatched and they'll take off, take off out of the parking lot and report that in the suspicious activity log. Just like you would greet people as they come in, you know, as soon as they come into the branch, you'll greet them and help you. And then, uh, and, and then if they say, no, I'm all set, they grab a brochure and they leave. You want to write down the time, the date and description of that person, what vehicle they might have. So if you are robbed soon after, you can compare that person with a, the robber. Um, it's very effective. When you when that, somebody does come into the branch, you want to make direct eye contact with them. Uh, making eye contact with them is threatening to them. They know now you know who they are. So if they are Casey, they probably won't come back. I'm going to make a huge distinction when to make eye contact and when not to. So greeting people is a great robbery deterrent. Always monitor interior and exterior camera coverage. Make sure the cameras are working properly. They, they're positioned properly. Um, 
um, and the time and the date is synchronized with uh, transaction time and drill time. Having signage on your door, remove sunglasses, hats, and hoods, or we may ask you to remove your medical mask temporarily for identification purposes is a great deterrent. And you should, uh, you know, have those. I mean, it's a good thing to have those signs out the door because it does work. And I know the police like the, these signs uh, being out there. Um, and it's one of those things where if, when there's somebody is casing you, once they see that sign, they know if they come in with any disguise on, they're going to be like in a fishbowl. So when you're being robbed, you want to remain calm as possible. Do not make direct eye contact with the person. Remember when somebody was casing you, you make eye contact with them. But when somebody comes in and in a threatening way, do not make um, eye contact. You want to remain calm. You want to follow instructions exactly. No more, no less. Do not make any sudden movements. If they ask you, do not include bait money, GPS, uh, die packs. Do not include it. Uh, and then activate the alarm whenever your credit union senior management team tell you to do so. Um, and some, again, will say immediately. Some will say when the robber's out of the building. And some will say, you know, when safe to do so. Um, so understand that. Um, but most credit unions are going away saying, you know, when safe to do so. And always, it, safety is the number one thing. You have the assurance. Uh, we don't care about the money. You know, we want to make sure that everybody is as safe as possible. Look, but don't steer. This is really critical. And a couple of things, key things, what type of accent the person has, height with the height markers. Am I right hand or left handed? If I was doing this presentation in front of you and I was re advancing my slides with my right hand, then chances are if I had my gun on my right hand, I would um, I would be right handed. And look for tattoos, sc uh, scars, moles, body piercings. Those are good identification. And also their shoes. A lot of times they might change their clothing, but they keep their shoes. After robbery, never uh, attempt to follow the robber. Immediately lock the door. Note the means of escape. Uh, you know, call the police and and tell them that we were just robbed. The robber, went, there was two robbers. They went west of Route 102 in a in a in a white convertible. Uh, the best chance of catching that criminal is within the first three to five minutes. They go to point A to point B. Uh, and if uh, there's a police detail or the police are driving by, they'll see that car. Also, out of fairness to the police, by calling them, let them know you were just robbed. If they pull over a vehicle that might just went, go through, went through a red light, if that's the case, if they went through a red light and the police uh, would have just thought it's a routine traffic violation, the people in the car think they're being pulled over because they just robbed the bank or credit union and they're looking at, you know, 20 years in jail. So something bad could happen to the police officer. Activate the robbery alarm, you know, call the police, as I mentioned, secure their uh, location, including the remaining cash, safeguard any evidence, access your prepared robbery packet, place temporary close sign on the door, request all witnesses to remain until the police arrive, but you cannot force a, uh, a member to stay in the credit union. You can't hold them against their will. It's called kidnapping. But you want to get their contact information. The police will, um, you know, uh, will get in touch with them. You really want them to stay because if you let them out, they're going to probably run to their car and the police are going to think they're the robber. Or if you let them out, the robber could take them as a hostage. But anytime you open that door to let them out, uh, the police, uh, anytime you open up that door to let them out, the robber could come back and hold everybody uh, hostage in the branch. And do not release any information to the media. And there's just some things in a robbery packet. You should know uh, basically the key things here are the assignment cards and contact information, publicity guidelines. So everybody should have a robbery credit, should have a robbery packet. You should know where these robbery packets you know, might be. And uh, different types of branches, open branch concepts. So if you have an open branch uh, with, you know, cafe or dialogue pods with uh, TCRs and TCDs, uh, there's different safeguards that you can um, have on these machines. I'm going to load them before hours and after hours, not during the business day. Have a limit placed per transaction or per teller. So the most anybody could get per transaction might be 2,500 without an over uh, without involving another person to do an override. A professional rob will know the capabilities of these machines. And even if you have the TCRs and TCDs, we still recommend you have a teller drawer at the teller station or at the dialogue pods um, area. Because again, if it's somebody who's topped up on drugs come in and say, give me the money in your top drawer and you don't have a drawer there and you go to your TCR or TCD, uh, they might think 
like you're hitting a robbery alarm button. So be aware of that. So again, I can set up all the controls for you for if you have dis dispensers and recyclers. Also, we've had robberies at interactive telemachines, whether they're in a branch or at the drive through And we've had robberies at drive through We still recommend that you give money out, shut the tube down in a drive through and then notify uh, uh, people in the front to lock the door, even though you're behind bullet resistive glass, um, even though you might not even have the bullet resistive glass, maybe it's just a tube system, they could send it through explosives or they could put an explosive in the branch. It's not worth it. Still send the money, shut that tube off and then, um, and then lock that door. Here are just some security controls, you know, decals, bullet resistive barriers, secured entryways, bait money, GPS, uh, tracking, security monitors, when you first walk in, you see yourself, uh, software in your phone, or when you open up uh, the branch, all clear systems, door gym height market cameras, remote panic alarms, and a lot of these branches now have access control technology instead of just keys. So minimize being a target, develop plans to follow and test them, establish response team, including law enforcement, uh, follow safe opening, closing procedures, reduce on-premise cash, Use force dual control. If you don't have a time lock on your safe or vault, no one person should have a key to the credit union, the alarm code, and also the access, the exterior door of your safe or your vault. If you if they do, they're more prone for um, extortion type robberies. Conduct employee training consistently. Stay aware and lock suspicious activity. You know, again, per person comes in, you approach them, they leave, write down that information, or you see a suspicious vehicle in the parking lot, and keep personal uh, employee information private. And I know I went over a lot of information um, in a in a short period of time, you know. But I just wanted to uh, address all the all the different areas uh, for your consideration. And again, I'll be more than happy to go in greater detail for your credit union, uh, you know, discuss it, in, it further. But uh, I I covered everything, Christine, in the half hour that yeah. I had. <laughs> No, that was a lot of information. It was very great. I hope people reach out to you because I know credit unions can always use a brush up of robbery training. And I feel like with everything that's going on with this world, we might even see an uptick in it yep. this year. And it's all value added the service, Christine. There's no additional charges if you're a policyholder. So, you know, if you want to call me, it's not costing any anything to do that. And, and take advantage of my you know, my 38 plus years of, of experience and what we see and our whole focus is on safety and there's no negative negative uh, ramifications of this. We just give you some recommendations and, and you don't have to respond to the review if I do a review or I do a training for the credit union. Uh, I also do branch security reviews as well. So it's all value added. Yep, nope. I know you did it at my credit union once that when I worked there and you did a great job and then we followed all your procedures and. You know, I think they're very helpful because it, it, you know, they do um, make you think twice about the area. You know, like you said, if you have all, all these protocols in place, then the robber is going to think twice about targeting your credit union. Yeah, and all this is exactly right. All the things you do before, it doesn't cost any extra like money to do all the subtle things that you do really makes a huge difference a professional, with a professional robber um, as well. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since we worked together at your credit union. But uh, yeah, I look forward to I'm out there for anybody who needs me. Perfect. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate You're welcome, you. Michael. You too. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. And so Dean. Yes. Is Dean here? So okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm Dean Martino with the Cooperative Credit Union Association. And I just realized my camera wasn't on. So give me a minute. So, um, and I am happy to introduce um, Jessica Avery, who took on the role of Director of Adv Advocacy at the Cooperative Credit Union Association in January of 2023. Uh, here, she has pioneered the integration of data into um, political action commun communications and strategy to boost giving. Uh, hailing from Western Massachusetts, she has amplified advocacy efforts and engagement with legislators in the region. Before joining the association, Jessica spent five years at the Massachusetts State House focusing on policy areas such as climate, energy, education, and veteran affairs. With a background in research and evaluation, at the Harold Grinspoon Foundation, she honed her skills in data analysts and tool development. 
Jessica also boasts campaign experience, notably managing Senator and Representative State Representative Shirley Ariga's historic election campaign. She holds a bachelor's degree in gender studies from Mount Holyoke College and a graduate degree in public policy and administration from UMass Amherst School of Public Policy. In her spare time, Jessica volunteers with her Mount Holyoke alumni class and serves as a scholarship reader with the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts. Um, Jessica, thank you for your time this morning and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my... Excellent. Um, so I can see part of the chat, um, but if anybody has questions, I invite you to hop in um, and ask them up front. So as Dean said, my name is Jessica Avery and I'm the Director of Advocacy with CCUA. And this morning I'm gonna give us a Credit Union's Guide to Advocacy 101. And so with that, I hope you're ready to jump into all things advocacy. So really what I'm hoping to get from this agenda is the understanding of what advocacy is and why it's critical for your credit unions to engage in it and how you can contribute to your credit union's advocacy today, as well as developing a repository of stories and data points to be able to boost your credit union's advocacy. So by the time we're done with this, uh, if I were to call on one of you, which I will not, I would hope that you would be able to pull out one story that really shows the credit union difference and how policy impacts your members. So before we dive into some of the more practical aspects, uh, what is advocacy and what are the many parts of advocacy? So advocacy is, as defined here, the action by which people or organizations influence decisions. So when we think about advocacy, I want you to ask yourself, yourself a couple questions. What are you sharing? What information are you sharing? And how are you sharing this information? So oftentimes when we think about advocacy, we think about protests or we think about someone going to the media, but also advocacy could include something uh, as simple as an op-ed. It could also include a short social media post. So thinking about the various and diverse ways that you can engage in advocacy is critical to being an effective advocate. And then also, too, we want to think about why we're sharing this story. So when we're sharing a credit union story, are we doing this to help someone understand the impacts of a policy? Are we doing this to help somebody understand how our credit union processes have empowered community members? And so when we think about advocacy, we really have to understand what our why is when we move forward. And then... I like to say that policy, that part of me, advocacy leads us to the politics process. And politics oftentimes is uh, looked at systemically, but when we're talking about politics in this situation, it's really just the decision-making power and agreements among people. So you wanna think about who are you sharing this information with? So from a congressional or state level, is it your state lawmakers? Is it your attorney generals? Consider who you're sharing this information with. And then really, why are you sharing this information with them? You wanna consider their power, their influence, and their position. So going back to that example of talking to your state legislator or attorney general, your attorney general will have different power than the state legislature. So understanding what you're trying to advocate for leads you to a more effective political process. And so then from there, we also talk about policy. So with effective advocacy in the political system, we can have really effective policies for our credit unions. So policies here are the guidelines and systems designed to guide action and decision making. So when we think about policies, we're thinking about what do we want to influence? If we are recognizing a regulatory burden on reporting that could be streamlined, how can we advocate and talk to our current elected officials and our sitting regulators to help them form and understand a policy that really directly impacts ourselves and our members? And so when we think about the what, we also have to think about the how. 
how do you want this policy to impact people? Uh, this essentially goes into a bit of strategic planning, but how do you want people to be impacted? What could be the negative consequences? So really thinking about it like that. And then finally, it's important to really emphasize why these policies are important and why this is something that lawmakers should want to move forward with. And so now that we kind of have an understanding of each of the pieces of the advocacy, political and policy process, I wanted to share how to effectively advocate. So uh, when we think about the concept of advocacy, it's really how we're communicating. And we can go back to Aristotle. This is something uh, that my colleague highlighted at GAC for those of you who are there, but we can really think about the ethos, pathos, and logos. So going back to the idea of who we are, what is our emotional tie? When we think about the logical reasoning, what are the outcomes? What are the financial implications? What are the data points that we are considering when having these conversations? So when you go into a conversation to advocate after you've already thought about your questions associated with the advocacy and the politics and the policy, you really want to be able to create a narrative and have a story. That's where having something like talking points can be beneficial, coming forward with stories and kind of having that repository, as I noted, really can help you to move forward. And this is where you can already utilize the information and resources that your credit union's using, that the league has access to as well. And so having that information and recognizing that it also can be up, updated often um, is helpful to make sure that your advocacy is also always evolving. And then two, this is uh, a nice note that we like to add. So as Dean noted, I also used to do data analysis. So data without context is a pretext. There's always going to be an underdog and there's always going to be a hero in the story. So also recognizing how you frame yourself and how policy is framed in those stories is really important. What we see uh, with data and how it can be used in different ways is really critical when thinking about your why and your who and your how. And so now that we have an understanding on what the advocacy process looks like for credit unions, I wanted to go into a bit about what the key credit union issues are. So without going into too much detail on all of these, uh, I could probably spend about an hour on each topic, but the main ones that I really want us to focus on are interchange and lending, as well as regulatory oversight, which falls under the overdraft programming. So when we talk about interchange, we're talking about the Credit Card Competition Act, which would impact the network fees associated with credit card transactions. What we're seeing right now is conversation between the merchants with retailers, uh, large restaurants, and as well as the banking and financial services sector. So there's really a number of folks involved in this conversation, but what ultimately I want us to remember as credit unions is that there is increased risk and increased cost associated with these programs, pardon me, with this policy, should it pass. And this goes back to that data. So although there is legislation that would exempt a good number of credit unions, the actual implementation of these policies doesn't play out in the same way. And that's where we can pull to historical data to point to that as well. And then the other topic that I would like to focus on is the loan cap. So member business loan and veteran loan caps are really a main focus. So veterans are one of the largest growing entrepreneurial groups in the United States right now. And when looking at accessing capital, particularly with the associated moves that come with being in the military, there is often trouble with veterans accessing loans. So these, these pieces of legislation both specific to veterans and non-veterans would expand and exempt where credit unions are lending, which again would allow for greater liquidity to be uh, 
loaned out when certain groups are exempt from our caps. And then it also allows credit unions to meet the needs of veterans, again, who have uh, potentially more complex needs than some of the other entrepreneurial communities. And then finally, I want to talk about the overdraft programming. So the CFPB has had a lot of conversation and has been putting out a number of rules on this. And so when we look at overdraft, we're really thinking about how are we providing services and products to our members who have opted into these services and products versus larger institutions and predatory institutions essentially using these overdraft fees as a uh, financial tool for themselves. So from that, when we think about the regulatory impacts, I um, also want to bring us into the federal landscape, which really ties us all together. So when we are talking about the these bills and we're talking about uh, these bills in front of Congress, what we're really focusing on is the direct advocacy, politics, and policy process. So for example, the financial services house chair, Patrick McHenry, announced his retirement. So the impact of that on future legislation and current legislation will be greater than if he had been remaining in place. So when you're considering policy, when you're considering regulatory changes, you have to really consider that full landscape. And that's why I wanted to include a piece on current Congress, because I also wanted to note that these ways of thinking can also be applied to your state legislature as well. So in considering how your state legislatures are working on state policy and how those impact your credit union, I think it's critical, again, to keep the lens of the who, what, and why. And then finally, I also wanted to discuss the credit union structure and regulatory impacts, which looks at the politics of the policy process. So with this, the credit unions as not-for-profits versus for-profit institutions have different political contribution requirements, have different taxation structures, and as we know, are member-owned cooperatives. So when we look at how politics influences our regulatory structures, we can look directly at how the NCUA functions. So the NCUA is um, often considered, uh, so, sorry, uh, when we consider the NCUA, we're also looking at the, um, regulatory appointments, and so with the NCUA, we can consider how congressional appointments, that policy and political process are impacting who is making our regulatory decisions. So that can also, again, be replicated on the state side as well. So states uh, such as Massachusetts, for example, have full insurance coverage. And so when we look at how states are able to provide their own regulation, again, this is where you can engage in advocacy on the state level. And so with that, I want to make sure that I have time to open it up for questions for everyone. Yes. If anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or you can put them in the chat um, and we can read them off to uh, Jessica. Hi, Dean, Jessica, it's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Um, I don't necessarily have a question, but I definitely have a comment on this. Um, as somebody that in the past four years has sat in the room quite a bit with larger institutions in the advocacy conversations within the CFPB and with CUNA and America's Credit Unions, um, I just wanna reiterate how important it is for us as small credit unions to be representative in those rooms because as Jessica said, a lot of the regulations that are out there being proposed are for larger institutions, but the trickle down effect on those is huge. Um, within what the current gonna cost us as the small credit unions 
if vendors have to change their pricing structures to kind of um, get to those points, but also everything rolls downhill. Um, so eventually those things will be um, on us to also comply with. And I think when we are in the room, we bring a much different perspective than the larger credit unions in the room. We have a lot more to think about as far as our community and our assets and our income. Um, and I think that perspective really lends a lot to the conversation. So I just encourage everybody to take part in those conversations, even if you think it doesn't really apply to us. Believe me, I know it's tiring. <laughs> We're all doing a bunch of stuff, um, but it really does have an effect for us to have a voice in those rooms. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else have questions or comments? I do have, oh, Susan, it looks like you've unmuted. Um, if you have a question, go ahead. Uh, so I have a quick question uh, for Jess. So cannabis banking has been a, a hot topic um, for a number of years now, especially since Massachusetts uh, made recreational use um, legal. Do you see that ever getting legalized on the federal level so credit unions can have the comfort level of uh, actually doing the banking without feeling they're violating uh, NSUA's examination rules? Um, the quick answer to that is possibly. I would say that this legislative cycle, there's not an appetite to have it happen. This is an election year and there are a number of seats um, as we saw, Congress is the closest that it's really ever been. Um, and so I think that potentially in the next five years, we could see it. And then what we're also seeing is a lot of executive action, which again, doesn't provide that same protection, but that's where going and using your advocacy efforts to say, this is happening on the executive level. We need to do this on the legislative level. Um, that's where kind of using advocacy to your advantage can help build that momentum, even if there isn't necessarily momentum in the area that you need. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from anyone? Uh, again, feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. Um, floor is open. We'll give it a couple more minutes. It looks like we have a shy bunch today. Uh, so with that said, Jessica, thank you so much for sharing that information, all great information. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. I want to thank my colleague, Christine from Vermont, for uh, being willing to partner with us again to uh, create this. We couldn't have done it without your help, Christine. Uh, she's the thank glue you. that keeps this thing together um, and keeps me going. <laughs> uh, the recording will be made available to everyone um, probably by the end of the week. So stay tuned for the announcement on that. And if you have questions on any of the presentations that you saw today or would like copies of anything, please reach out to Christine or myself and we will get them over to you. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day.